Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. God's good. Amen. It's a good thing to be able to stand before the people of God, which are the most beautiful people on the face of this earth. And if you don't believe me, uh, the Bible says, Out of Zion, which is the church in that scripture, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. I don't know how you can get any more beautiful than perfection of beauty. Amen. It's a good thing to be saved, even though we've got things that we have to deal with in our minds. Sometimes the devil will try to weigh our minds down. Sometimes we're overthinkers. Sometimes we've got problems in our bodies, and we might sit and wonder, Lord, how long do I have to overthink? How long do I have to have this problem in my, in my body? How long do I have to have this problem in my mind? But I remember the scripture said, uh, Beloved, it doth not appear uh, what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. How long? Just to, like the song says, just a little while to stay here. Just a little while to wait. Amen. Just a little while to labor in the path that's always straight. Amen. Just a little while. You know what the solution is going to be is the rapture. Amen. That's the best thing that we have to look forward to. And there's not too much that we could look forward to in this life. Amen. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. And he's given us abundant spiritual blessings in this life. And there's a natural benefit that comes to being saved. But the absolute best and most precious thing that we have to look forward to to solve our problems here is the rapture of God's church. Amen. Amen. Let's get ready. Amen. All right. In the book of Jude, chapter number four. I wish that was an act. I wish that was on purpose. <laughs> Jude chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. The book of Jude is interesting. I've got it written in my Bible, something along the lines of the spirit of those that crept in unawares. This epistle is dealing with that. Something that's interesting to me about the word of God is, as the scripture says, that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. The more that we understand about the Word of God, the more we can understand not only about the rest of the Bible, but about the world around about us. See, we're dealing, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And as there was certain men that crept in unawares back then, there are now certain men that are crept in unawares today. And for us to understand these people, what they're doing, um, and how we can better defend ourselves, we need to understand the Word of God. If you, look, if you read this book, and you can also read Second Peter chapter 2 in your own time, there's a parallel between the two, and he's dealing with the same sort of people, these, these people that creep in unawares. Amen? Amen. Now, we're going to just start um, reading, um, and what's going to happen is I'm going to ask you to read, and I'll stop you at appropriate points, not to get you frustrated, but so that we can get a sense of what the Bible is saying. Amen? Amen. I'm not up here to just talk and try to find scripture to back it up. I'm here to read the scripture and give the sense of it. Amen. That's how they did it in the book of Nehemiah. They read the scripture and they gave the sense of it. Amen. So that's what we're going to do. So if we'll start, we'll start in the last chapter of Jude. And that time that was on purpose. <laughs> Starting with verse number three. Let's go ahead and read. I'm going to stop you. Okay. Belo beloved. When I when I gave all diligence to write. Now, he didn't write this flippantly. He did this purposefully, and he took his time. He put his care and effort into writing to him. Now, what did he write, on, what did he write unto him about? Of the, of the common salvation. Now, he gave all diligence to write of the common salvation. Now, you might take that word common and take it to mean that it's so common that everybody's got it. But now you have to understand, we have to define the Bible by the Bible. So Jesus said, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. So he can't be saying that it's so common that everybody has it. See, the word common has, has more uh, meaning than that. See, common in this sense means that everybody that has this salvation has the same salvation, and they've received it the same way. See, the apostle Peter um, was, was of the mind that only Jews were to receive salvation. And then the Samaritans received it, and then he went to a, um, a Gentile's house whose name was Cornelius. And there he uh, started talking about the word of the Lord, and the Holy Ghost fell on them. And later he had to go and stand trial for it. 
He, had, he was held accountable because the church was an organized body in that day. He was held accountable because under the law, it was unlawful for them to go into the, the house of the Gentiles. So they put him on the carpet. They said, you went into men uncircumcised. And he rehearsed the matter. And at one point he said that as he began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. So he said, just like the Holy Ghost fell on us, it fell on them. And how did he know it was just like them? Because, now here's the thing, some people today think that um, once you say that you believe in God, you've received the Holy Ghost. Well, then how would you know that somebody's received the Holy Ghost? If anybody that just says they believe, we know not everybody that says they believe actually believes. So then how would you know that somebody receives the Holy Ghost? That would be confusion. And God's not an author of confusion. And one point he says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And they said, just like they received it, we, just like we received it at the beginning, they received it. So they knew that they, received, that they received the Holy Ghost because they heard them speak in other tongues. Amen. This is the initial sign of receiving the Holy Ghost. So these people that talk about, well, you know, I, I said I believed and I just I felt the warm feeling go down my spine. Amen. And like all my troubles were all over. Amen. Well, if you felt like all your troubles were all over, then you received the wrong kind of salvation. Amen. Now the devil's after you now that you get saved. Amen. But God's still good anyways. Okay. How do you know you've received the Holy Ghost? Amen. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak in other tongues. They shall speak in new tongues. Amen. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Now knowest not the sound thereof. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. Amen. For the men of stammering lips and another tongue. If you have received the Holy Ghost other than with stammering lips and another tongue, you haven't received the common salvation because everybody that's received it, it's common to them that they've received it the same way as everybody else. Amen. God's good. So he wrote of the common salvation. Let's keep reading. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered. Now, if I could say it like this, not to change its meaning, but to add emphasis, once for all delivered. Amen. He delivered it once for all. It, the scripture talks about it began to be spoken by the Lord and was conform, confirmed with signs. And then it was delivered unto us by them that heard him and God bare them witness with different diverse gifts and uh, uh, miracles and, and workings of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And they were supposed to go on and teach that. So it was once delivered unto the saints. Now let's keep reading verse 4. 4. Now hold on a second because I'm going to start with this word for. Now the word for here is the same as because. So because what? Well, it was needful for me to tell you that you need to earnestly contend for the faith. You need to steadfastly fight for what's been taught. Why? Well, he tells you why in verse 4. Now let's read 4. Because there are crept in unawares. Now, there are certain men crept in unawares. Not that we were unaware that they were even here, but we were unaware that they believed what they believed. There are certain people that will come up through the church. They'll, they'll come and they'll get saved. They'll sit under a pastor, and you won't think that they believe anything different. They'll sit here in the pews, they'll get up, they'll testify about Jesus' name baptism and about the Holy Ghost. They'll go to the PAW council, they'll get their credentials, they'll sit under the bishop and be taught in the minister's meetings, they'll go and they'll start preaching different places, they'll finally find themselves a church. And you know what happens when the kid who sat under the parents and the kid didn't agree with what the parents taught, but you know they just did it while they lived in their house, and then now they get their own place, you know they're not going to do it anymore. Amen. That's what happens with these people. And they start teaching things that's been contrary to what they've been taught. The whole time they agreed with it. But now that they went out, they're teaching something different. Why? Because they didn't believe it the whole time. They only said that they did so that they could creep in and try to act like they fit in. Amen. They crept in unawares. We didn't know they, they believed what they believed, but they come out. Now let's, let's, see what, let's, let's read about them. Certain men crept in unawares who ordained to this condemnation now immediately some people would see predestination that is God's chosen some to be condemned and he's chosen some to be saved amen but I remember the scripture says according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world when it talks about being chosen for salvation the word chosen when, when it comes to our salvation never refers to singular it always refers to plural 
God did not choose specific people to be condemned. What he did choose was that anybody that did what they would do is going to be condemned. Now, whether we do what they do or not, that's up to us. Now, as a sidebar, God did know what we were going to do before we ever did it. But he set the standards of if you do this, you're going to be condemned. And if you don't do this and you believe with your heart, amen, you repent, amen, in obedience to the gospel and you live holy, amen, you'll see me. Amen. amen. But if you don't, amen, and you do these things, you're ordained to this condemnation. Not that he chose you specifically to do it, but that he knew you were going to do it. Amen. And now we've done it and fallen victim, amen, to that condemnation. So who were before old of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, let's read, into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so we're talking about certain men crept in unawares. So now here's the thing is, like I said, we've got these people now and we have to, the defense here is to earnestly contend for the faith. We need to learn what the faith is and we need to learn how to fight for it so that we can fight against these certain men. So our defense against these sort of people is earnestly contending for the faith. Amen. But we're going to talk about how not to become like these certain men. So we're not going to take the route of earnestly contending uh, per se, but we're going to take the route of not becoming like these people who crept in unawares. Amen. Let's read verse 11 and read a little, find out a little bit more about these people. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So those people that have crept in unawares, they've got a spirit similar or being related to here in the Bible as, ba from, as Balaam. Amen. So we're uh, here in the New Testament are referencing something that happened in the Old Testament for us to understand what's happening nowadays. The scripture says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the things that happened in the Old Testament, they didn't happen for their benefit. The scripture said it happened for our admonition, for our benefit, upon whom the ends of the worlds are come. So all the things that happened in the Old Testament weren't for Israel's benefit. They were for our benefit and for our learning. And so what we're going to do is we're going to learn about Balaam. We're going to talk about Balaam so that we can learn how not to be like Balaam. Amen? Amen. So let's go back to talk about Balaam in the book of Numbers, chapter number 22. And we're going we're gonna to hold to the same pattern here. We're, we're going to read together. I'll have you read together. And then we'll stop at the appropriate places to get the sense of the scripture. Amen. Amen. This train carries no sleepers. All right. Verse number five. Then we can read when we get there. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people to call him. Now, hold on a moment. There was Balak, okay? And Balak was, was, the, king, was the king in this situation. Now, how do you remember the difference between Balaam and ba uh, Balak? Well, how I do it is the K is for king, Balak. At the end of Balak, he got the K. So Balak was the king, okay? And so Balak saw Israel, which was, which was big in numbers, Amen. And he was afraid that Israel was going to come in. And he said, they're going to lick up all what's around us like an, like an ox licks up the field. They're going to come in and take all this. So he was afraid. And so what he wanted to do was to get a prophet to come and to curse these people so that he could fight them, so that he could win and prevail, and that he could, all those things would still be there. Amen. So he sent people to Balaam, and he said to call him, saying, Behold, there's a people come out from Egypt. So ba Balak sent to Balaam. And the first thing that he told him was to say, Behold, there's a people come out from Egypt. So this is how we know that Balaam, the prophet, was not from Israel. If he was from Israel, Balak wouldn't have told, needed to have told him that there's a people come out from Israel. He would have said, Hey, your people have come out from Israel. But he was telling him there's a people that's come out from Israel. So Balaam was a heathen prophet. He was a prophet that was not of the children of Israel. Behold, there's a people come out from Egypt. Behold, mm -hmm. they bide over against me. Verse 6. 
Curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. So actually what it was, um, to retract kind of what I said before, was he wanted, he, he wanted to fight against them and to prevail. But he knew that if God was for them, he wasn't going to be able to prevail. So what he needed was he needed somebody to curse them. Amen? They're too uh, mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and... Uh Uh-huh. Blessed and he whom thou cursest is cursed. So we'll find actually it was Balaam that knew that God was going to fight for them. Balak just wanted him, uh, Balaam to curse the people. Amen. So, verse 7. Departed with the rewards of divination. Now, hold on a moment. In their hand. So, what happened was when he sent these people, he sent them with rewards of divination. He sent them with, with some cash. So now, he was going to pay him to come and to curse these people. Amen. Now, how many um, of us are going to be challenged in our faith and to, to go around what we've been taught and to go around right with money? See, because this is what was wrong with Balaam. If he wasn't so concerned about earthly substance and reputation, then none of this stuff would have moved him. But see, they came with rewards of divination. Now, something happens to uh, preachers and particular, maybe particularly pastors when it comes to being greedy of filthy lucre. And this is why the Bible gives a stipulation that a pastor or a bishop should not be greedy of filthy lucre. Amen. When we're greedy for money, when we're greedy for things, we will um, compromise. We'll go back on what we said we believe. We'll go back on what we said out of our own mouths was right and do what we said was wrong all for money. Amen. That's the power of greed in our heart. Amen. So it's important for us to look at ourselves and make sure, am I greedy for rewards of divination? Amen. Let's keep reading. In their hand, and they came unto Balaam. Remember that now. They came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. So they came to him with the rewards of divination. They told him, look, there's a people coming. We're going to pay you to come and curse this people so that we can fight them and die. Now, Balaam went to God, and God told him, don't go. And so Balaam went to them and said, sorry, God told me, and in so many words said, God told me I can't go. I'm not going to go. Go back to your own country. So uh, they did that. They went back to their own country, and look at, skip down to verse 14. And look at what they told Balak, these people that went out. Rose up. And they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. And Balak sent princes more and more honorable than they. So now he's sending people. He's not just sending anybody this time to go and get them. Now he's sending people with a higher reputation. See, now he, he, he's, he's getting people with a, with a higher stature to go and to try to win him over, to come uh, be a preacher for hire. Amen. More and more honorable than they. Verse 16. They came to Balaam. There it is again. Amen. This, this brother was persistent. He didn't, he didn't go on to try to find somebody else to come and curse the people. He wanted um, Balaam to come and curse the people. Now, here's the thing. is That's how the devil does to us. The devil is persistent. Not only is he persistent in trying different things with us, he'll do the same thing over and over. Amen. We can have the same problems over and over again. Amen. So what happens is Jesus said it like this. The prince of this world cometh, but hath found nothing in me. Now notice how he said cometh. Now Jesus said uh, man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. That ETH is important. When you see ETH in the Bible, it means a continual, continually. So what's he saying? The prince of this world continues to come and he's finding nothing in me. So the devil is going to continually come and see what it is that he can find in us to get us. So just this, that's the same way that Balak sent to Balaam. 
He wasn't quitting the first time. Now this time, he's not just sending anybody. He's going to send people with a higher reputation. And now watch this. And they came unto him uh, and said unto him, Thus saith ba uh, Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Watch this. Verse 17. For I will promote thee unto very great honor. Amen. I'll let you be a bishop. Amen. I'll let you be district elder. Amen. I'll let you be president of the company if you just come and do this thing that's wrong. Amen. I'll promote you. I'll give you that position you've been wanting. You know you want to move up in the company. Just tell a little lie. Amen. See, that's how, that's how we are presented with wrong. See, it's not, sometimes it's not just, it's not just the, uh, uh, the muffin. See, it's the cupcake that'll get you. Amen. When it's got the frosting on it. Yeah. See, it wasn't just he was telling him to come lie. He was saying, you come, or, you come and curse this people now, and I'm going to promote you. Right. See, now these are people with reputation that are going to come to him this time. We've got reputation, see, and he'll promote you. He'll bring you up. You want to come up and be and have a high name? You want to have a big name in the PAW? Just do this wrong. Amen. I will promote thee unto very great honor. Now, here's the thing is that Balak was promising commotion, uh, promotion. But the Bible says, Promotion cometh neither from the east, nor the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth one down and setteth up another. God is the one to whom we should be looking for promotion. And do we fight for it like the world fights for it? No. Jesus said, He who's been faithful over few things shall be made ruler over many. If we just stay faithful in doing what it is that God would have us to do, then God will move us up in due time, in due season. Amen. But what is this man doing? Come and do wrong, and I'll move you up. Amen. Amen. But he promises him something else. Watch this. And, and I'll do whatsoever thou sayest. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Whatever you want, whatever the price, you name your price and come. Amen. And, and do this thing for me, and I'll give it to you. Amen. I, I remember the story that uh, Bishop Herman, uh, who just recently passed away, told of there was a time where he was pastoring um, a church that didn't believe oneness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ. They believed, uh, like the, a previous pastor they had taught, two gods, Old Testament Jehovah God and, and New Testament Jesus. And they told him, they said, uh, or they told his wife, if he'll teach what this person taught will make him a king. What did he have to do to become a king to them? Just compromise on the oneness of the Godhead. Just do what we say. Just do what's wrong. We'll give you honor. We'll do whatever you want us to do. See, this is the way that the world will come to us, not just as preachers, but even as lay members or in our job. However, see, we'll be offered with promotion if we just do wrong. If our hearts aren't towards God, then we'll be moved by it. See, I remember there was a time where I was sitting down at the uh, receptionist de desk at a previous job I'd worked at, and somebody called, and they told me, tell them, and so many words, tell them that the boss is not here. And if my memory served me right, the boss was standing right in front of me. Well, I wasn't going to lie now. But if I was so concerned in moving up and, and pleasing those people, and if I was so uh, concentrated on getting a promotion or getting some kind of raise, if that was my first priority, how much more of a fight would it have been? Right. Our hearts can't be fixed on promotion. Our hearts can't be fixed on wealth. Now, Jesus, uh, the Bible says, no good thing with, will he uh, withhold from them that walk upright. Now, if I didn't believe that, and I was, what if I was afraid and said, well, you know, if I don't lie, what if I get fired? You know, I've got to lie. Well, then I don't have faith to believe what it is that God told me that he would do. Because he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So see, holiness takes faith. I've got to believe that God can do what he said he would do in the spite of every other situation. Now, this man is being tempted to compromise for his promotion. Amen. But... Uh, remember, Abram was uh, presented with a, comp was a, with a compromise. See, the king of Sodom came to um, uh, Abram and wanted to make a contract with him. But he wouldn't do it. He said, lest you say that I'm blessed by your hand. Amen. Amen. But God showed up to him and said, fear not, Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. 
So in the midst of the world saying, you've got to do what we want to do if you want to be taken care of. God says, you don't worry about that. I'll worry about you. You just worry about pleasing me. Amen. Amen. So our first priority, our first thought should be concentrated on doing the will of God and not putting the first commandment he gave. Amen. In Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But how quick are we to put money and promotion and things before God? Now, the dangerous thing is that we can sit right in the church and do that. Doing things not for God, but so that we can be promoted. We have to examine our hearts. Now, what kind of sad, frustrating, spinning your uh, uh, tires? See, I remember um, one of my siblings now when we were younger, she got a bike. Amen. And she was spinning those wheels and it was in the living room. But for some reason, it might have been the way that the floor was might have been bowed. That bike was going nowhere, but she was moving those little feet. Amen. How frustrating of a position is it to where we can get ourselves like that with God? We're trying to do all these things, get promoted, get promoted, but our heart's not towards God the whole time. So we're doing all these things, not getting promoted. How frustrated are we going to be? Why don't we just learn to love God and not be frustrated and go to heaven? And not be like Balaam. Amen. So they came. I'll do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore pray thee. Curse me this people. So he was presented with the offer of promotion. Whatever you tell me to do. Name your price. I'm going to do it. And now what he does. Well he says. Well you know. Okay I'm going to go in. Uh, in other words. I'm going to go seek God over the issue. Now God already told him No. But now, see, they come, more honorable people come, and the promotion's offered to him. Now he's got to go see God uh, again all of a sudden. God already told him no. God already knew that those people were going to offer him promotion. Amen. The best thing he could have done was say, no, I told you no. God told me no. Leave me alone, brother. You know, God's good. Amen. So what he does was he seeks God, but God was so angry with Balaam, he said, go. Now, we can press God after God's told us no. We can press him enough to where he says, go ahead. And we've stepped out of the will of God. He said, go ahead. Now it's going to be to our own destruction. Balaam was in such a sad state because uh, of his heart that God said that his way is perverse. Thy way is perverse before me. All because of the, the love of money in his heart. The love of the promotion in his heart. The love of, his, uh, of, of high reputation in his heart. Amen. So um, he brings him to a mountain. Balak brings him to a mountain and he sees um, uh, Israel and he won't curse him on the mountain. And if we don't read carefully, we'll think that Balaam uh, just walked away from the situation and never did anything to harm Israel. But we might be surprised tonight. Let's read. Let's skip over to Numbers chapter 25. Now we're going to, like they might say in the playwriting uh, world, we're going to, how does it exit stage left here? We're going to cut scene and go to Numbers 25. We're going to see something that happens with Israel. And then we're going to, I'm going to take us behind the scenes of what had happened to make this thing happen. Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3. Let's read. Israel abode in Shittim and with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And did eat and and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So when Israel gets into false worship in the Bible, you see it commonly referred to as whoredoms. And it's appropriate. Because of uh, the false religion at this time, it had a lot to do with uh, literal adultery and fornication, different sexual immoralities. So when God calls it whoredoms, I mean, there was such a clear visual representation of literal whoredom going on that it was very appropriate for him to call false worship whoredoms. And what was the problem that they had done? They joined themselves unto unto Baal Peor. Now, this is something that we're up against today because even the apostolic church is up against people trying to uh, promote what's called, um, how do you say it, Um, ecumenism. See, let's all just get all of God's people together. Amen. All of them. It don't matter if if you don't really have the Holy Ghost like the Bible has. Let's just all get together. Amen. And we can all be saved together. Amen. We don't have to. Let's not preach Jesus because it might offend some people. 
See, it might offend some people if I say Jesus is God. So to not offend people, I'm going to stop saying that Jesus is God so that we can get more people in. The Bible calls it holding the truth and unrighteousness. Amen. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith God. Amen. We, that's not our goal is to be joining together with the world. Amen. Amen. This caused a serious problem. It caused their whoredom and it caused them serving Baal. And Baal was known uh, as the god of fertility. And it involved things such as debauchery, lustful activities, and ritual dancing. See, so they got in all this filthiness. Amen. And it caused such a problem that there was 24,000 people killed in a plague because of it. God said, hang them by their heads. Amen. All because they got into this. Now, let's find out how they got into it. Uh, Numbers chapter 31. Amen. Balaam's going to rear his ugly head again. Let's, read, let's start with verse number 7. But what, hap- <clears throat> excuse me, what happens is that God tells Moses to go kill, the, go kill them. Go kill these Midianites. Go kill these people. Um, and Moses now tells him, go ahead. Go and now slay these people. These are the people of the women um, that they were associating themselves with that got them in this plague where there were 24,000 people killed. God's saying, go kill them. And verse number 7. And slew all the males. And verse 8, beside the rest of them that were slain, Levi, Rach, and Zer, and Hur, and Reba, five kings of Midian. Who else did they kill? Uh huh. Who else did they kill? Balaam also, the son of Baor. They slew with the sword. Well, why would they go and kill Balaam? Why would they go do something like that? Well, we'll get there. Look, look what they did, though. Look what they made the mist- uh, Look what they did. Verse number nine. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captive. So now they're not killing everybody. They're just taking cap- people captive, and their little ones, and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. Now go down to verse number fifteen. Moses addresses them keeping captives. He's he's telling them, don't take captives. Watch watch why. Verse fifteen. Moses said unto them. Have you saved all the women alive? Have you done this? Verse 16. Behold, the children of Israel, watch, through the counsel of Balaam. So Balaam did counsel them to do something. Let's keep reading. To commit trespass against the Lord in the battle of Peor. Now that's what we just read about where there's 24,000 killed. He, com- he convinced them through his counsel to, to do trespass against the Lord. And there's a plague among the, the congregation of the Lord. So I said earlier, Balak knew. Balaam knew that God isn't going to curse these people, Balak, while they're serving him. What we have to do is to get them to be wrong with God, and then God won't fight for them. And then you can defeat them. So what did he get them to do? He got them to join together. Amen. And commit and commit fornication. Now, God told them don't go in the first place. And now it ended up in his death. They said it said the Bible said they slew him. So all because he wanted the promotion. He wanted the money. He got he did something he shouldn't have done and got slain. How much better of it would have been for him to just be content. Amen. Amen. And not end up in the lake which burneth with fire. Amen. How much did that promotion do him when he was getting cut up? By the sword. Amen. They didn't do him too much good at that point. See, what was it that caused Balaam to go astray? It was the love of money in his heart. Now, we have to learn to defend against this. Because this is a condition that exists today. Remember, we read, he said, there are certain men crept in unawares. And he says that these people are like Balaam. So, this condition exists today. We have to be aware of it. And we have to be, like the scripture says, examining ourselves. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. We have to be looking at ourselves and make sure that we're not like this. The Apostle Paul said it like this. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. See, the Apostle Paul said himself, I could be a castaway. I'm taking my body and I'm bringing it into subjection. I'm making it do what God wants it to do. Because if I don't, I could be a castaway. 
Now, I know that some people say that once you've been saved, you can't be unsaved. But the Apostle Paul himself said that he could be a castaway. And the Apostle Paul said about himself, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles. So the Apostle of the Gentiles said that he could be a castaway. Now, what does that mean to us? I don't believe that there's a single Jew in here today. I don't know how many of us would know a single Jew that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost personally. Maybe one or two. God's New Testament church is primarily Gentiles. So the Apostle Paul was the apostle to most of God's New Testament church. Amen. Amen. And he said that he could be a castaway. So who am I to think that I could do whatever I want and still be saved? How much higher would that put me above the Apostle Paul? Because he said that he could be a castaway. So we need to learn to bring our body into subjection because we could fall to the same circumstances that Balaam fell to. Amen? So what was it that, brought, that made Balaam go, uh, go astray? 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And starting with verse number 5. Let's go ahead and read. Men of corrupt minds. What kind of minds did they have? Corrupt minds. Okay, let's, let's, let's listen about these corrupt minds. And... Supposing that gain is godliness. Some people think that gain is godliness. Some people think that the proof of if you're right with God or not is how blessed you are. In this world, amen. Look at all that God's given me. Look at this beautiful church I've built. You know God must be with us. There, there are gangsters in this world that have better stuff than church folks have ever had. And we know that they're not right with God. Is that right? Amen, amen that's right. Our gain is not godliness. How much money we have in our bank account, that doesn't mean that we're saved. Amen. How big our house is or how nice as our cars are, that doesn't mean that we're saved. Amen. But he says this, uh, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So the opposite um, is true. Now, now he says this, supposing that gain is godliness. Who said it? Uh, men of corrupt minds. Amen. So if we're of the mind that how much we have means that we're right with God or not, we have a corrupt mind. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, don't throw no stones now. That's what the Bible said. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Men of corrupt minds think that the more you have, that must mean that God's with you. Amen. And ain't that sad thinking about the condition of the church today. We're rich and increased with goods, in need of nothing. But we don't even know that we're poor, miserable, blind, naked, and wretched. That's what the Bible says. Now, I'm not just saying that to be mean. That's what the Bible says. You can read in your own time. Revelation chapter number 3. Amen. So our gain is not godliness. The fact that now we have what we didn't have years ago does not mean that God's for us. Amen. What are we doing? Amen. The benefits that those have, uh, 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 that those have sown before, we're reaping. Amen. The pastors here at this church have slowly built this church better. I heard the story of when this was just a basement. And man, they'd baptize you in the vault. I heard the story of one uh, pastor who said when they baptized him, he said they had enough courtesy to break the ice off the top, but they didn't break the ice off the bottom. <laughs> We've come from a mighty long way. Over time, uh, when we're faithful with money, God, we, God allows us to gain more. So let's not become like the prodigal son who takes the inheritance and goes out and does whatever we want to do with it. Just because we have something doesn't mean that God is with us. Now, I'm not saying God is, is not with us here at Christ Temple. I believe this is a blessed church, and I still believe to this day that this is the second best thing that God's ever done for me is allow me to come here and sit under Elder Johnson. Amen. Next to being saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and running for my life. Amen. Amen. But what I am saying is this. Just because we live in a day where we have all these things it doesn't mean that God's for us. We have to examine ourselves daily. He didn't say walk in the Spirit and you'll have all kinds of people showing up to your church. He said walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. How do we know that we're being saved? If we continue in the gospel, settled, built up, rooted, grounded, as we have been taught, are we doing what the Word of God says? Where's our heart? Is our heart towards God or is our heart towards promotion like with Balaam? Because now here's the thing with Balaam. Balaam started off saying no. But when he, was, when he was pushed with it, he went. Amen. 
So the thing is, is that if our hearts aren't right towards God, we might not see some kind of problem overnight. But down the road, there will something that will come and push us. Amen. And cause us to compromise. So how important is it for us today? On tonight, on Tuesday, what's today? The 5th? The 4th? Amen. 11-5-2019. Let's look at ourselves. Amen. And say, is there something in me that's not pleasing to you? If Balaam had done that, if Balaam had made it so that his heart wasn't towards the money, what, what, what temptation would it have been? The promotion. If he said, I'm not interested in promotion, I'm interested in pleasing God. And if God tells me stop prophesying, I'm going to stop prophesying. Amen. Amen. But how many uh, preachers today, if God told them stop preaching, would they stop? Well, now I done got myself in this thing now. I can't, I can't, now I heard the story of this. There's a um, particular, well, amen. Thank you, Lord. Y'all want to know the story, don't you? Amen, amen. All right. He said, men of corrupt minds say that gain is godliness. Amen. Uh, now, what does he, now watch what he tells us to do uh, with these people. From such, which withdraw thyself. He said, don't, be, don't spend your time with these sort of people. The people that are saying, God is with me because look at all that I have. You aren't right with God if you're broke. How many people preach a prosperity gospel nowadays? God isn't with you if you're broke. If you're saved, you're going to have a load of cash in your wallet. Amen. But he says, godliness, godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, from such, withdraw thyself. Don't spend your time with these people because they're going to make you like they are. Amen. The Bible says evil communication corrupts good manner. Evil lifestyle will make us have an evil lifestyle. Amen. The more we listen to that preaching of prosperity, the more we listen to people who aren't content with their own lives, the more we will be uncontent with our own lives and be slain like Balaam was. Maybe not literally, but spiritually, we'll find ourselves lukewarm, sitting in the church, more concerned about loving the world and the things of the world than hearing God. Now, this is a dangerous condition because Jesus said, He that hath an ear, let him hear. There are some people filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, sit in the church, the gospel goes forward, and they'll say, well, that was nice, and they walk away and don't do any of it. Don't realize that God, that all those things would have applied to their life. If they just would have had a heart towards God to hear. Amen? Amen. Amen. He says, from such withdraw thyself, lest we fall into the same problem. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, he did not just say godliness is great gain. He said godliness with contentment. See, we need to learn to be content. Amen. Amen. And we'll talk about that here in a little while. Verse 7. For we brought nothing in this world. And it is certain we can only carry our title out. We can carry nothing out. Amen. What does it matter? What's it going to matter in the rapture if I was a bishop or not? What's it going to matter in the rapture if I had... Now, I've been watching skateboard videos lately. What's it going to matter if I had the nicest skateboard out there or not? Amen. Y'all know I play guitar. What's it going to matter if I had the nicest guitar collection in cast or not when I get to heaven? I can't bring none of it with me. So how much better is it for me to receive? The Bible says this. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Am I going to trade all things for five or six guitars? Amen. Or for a title of bishop, see, all you got to do, brother. Now, I'm not saying anybody's like this, but let's say I was presented with the situation. of All you got to do to become bishop is... We just need you to stop teaching uh, Jesus is God. We need you to stop talking about speaking in tongues. Amen. There are, amen. God's good. This sort of thing is happening. Just making that, just saying that. This sort of thing is happening. And we have to keep our hearts in check. Otherwise, we are able to fall to the same thing. See, I heard somebody say, um, uh, they told me the story of how they would tell their mom, I would never do that. And their mom said, well, you're not dead yet. We don't know what we would do if we walk in the flesh. Amen. If we're walking in the flesh, we'll be likely to do all kinds of junk. Amen? Well, excuse the terminology, but that's the truth. If we're not walking after the Spirit, the Scripture says, if you walk after the flesh, 
ye shall die. But if ye do through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of this flesh, you shall live. Amen. We have to walk in the Spirit. There is now, there is now therefore no condemnation, amen, to them that are in Christ Jesus, to them that walk after the Spirit. If we don't want condemnation on our lives, like Balaam had condemnation on his life, and like certain men who creep in unawares in their life, we got to continue to walk in the Spirit. And that doesn't just mean coming in and speaking in tongues. Amen. How quick are we to say, let's not quench the Spirit. Amen. And I believe in rejoicing in the Lord. But if you really want to quench the Spirit, go out and, and, and cuss somebody out. Now that's, now that's quenching the Spirit right there. Amen. If we walk in the Spirit, Amen. Now, I've heard stories of people who have danced out of their shoes, of, of a person who danced out their shoes and danced back into their shoes. Amen. God, the anointing of God is a real thing. But he did not say if you walk in the Spirit, you'll dance in and out your shoes. He said if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I love shouting. I love feeling the anointing of God. I love feeling all my burdens lifted. Amen. And like my troubles are gone away for, for a moment. Amen. And like I've been ascended into the third heaven itself. Amen. It's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, I, had a, I heard one person say one time um, at, a, at a different church, they didn't teach like we taught. They said, he said that you don't need to be seeking an experience with God. But the Bible said, taste and see that the Lord is good. God wants us to have a relationship with him. God wants us to see for our own selves. Not just through the eyes of David. Not just through the eyes of Jacob. Not just through the eyes of Peter, Paul, Silas, James, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. Any of these guys. He wants us to know for ourselves, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I love, amen, getting up a shout. I love feeling the anointing of God. But the important thing... Amen, is that we live holy. Amen, don't, don't get me wrong, he wants our praise. We ought to praise him. He's worthy of the praise, amen? Amen, but sinners can praise God. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshipers shall arise. What shall worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Bible says all his ways are truth. Amen, those people that are striving to walk with God. Amen, give him the praise for your life. Give him the praise for keeping you holy when the devil's, amen, grinning at you. Amen. God's good to keep you at, uh, at that point too, isn't he? Amen. So godliness with contentment. He says in verse 8, And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But, now, the word but is a conjunction. The word and is a conjunction. The word and is a conjunction connecting two similar thoughts. The word but is a conject, uh, conjunction connecting two opposite thoughts. So when we see the word but, we're seeing the opposite side of what he just said. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. So as we're praying, asking God for more money, we're asking him for more temptations. Amen. And more hurtful lusts and traps. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Let's pray like, it, uh, like the psalmist prayed. Give me neither riches nor poverty, but feed me with food that's convenient for me. Some of us might get so rich we forget God. And sometimes we might get so broke that we curse God. But give me what I need. Lord, you know what I need and let me get that. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Verse, uh, it hurtful us with drowning men and destruction and perdition of verse 10. For money is the root. Ah, Jesus said, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. I skipped over some words there, didn't I? For the love of money. Money's not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Amen. The dollar bill doesn't make you sin. Your greed makes you sin. Hallelujah. Amen. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. Now watch what some people have done with the love of money. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Some people that love money, it'll turn them aside from the faith. Amen. And pier yes, amen, sister. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Some people love money so much that they'll let it pull them from God. Not realizing, like the scripture says, that it's God that giveth thee power to get, give, get wealth. The scripture says, God give, giveth us liberally all things to enjoy. God gave us the strength to get it. God gave us, uh, gave us the strength to keep it. And now we ought to thank God for what we have. Amen. He told Israel, 
um, something along these lines of when you come into the land and you get all these things, don't forget me. Don't forget me that gave it to you. Amen. Amen. And they did. Let us not fall to the same example. Didn't we, said that we, didn't we say that those things were written for our benefit? They forgot God when they came into something. Let's not forget God. Amen. Let's not forget in our church activities. We're serving God. What am I, I'm going to use me for an example so I don't hurt nobody's feelings. Amen. What, anything I am, uh, Paul said, let's, uh, God forbid I should boast of anything that God has not wrought by my own hands. So let me do that now for a minute. I'm not driving the van because I'm so great. I'm not driving the van just for Brother Christian or so that brother, you people can see Brother Christian driving the van. I'm driving the van because I love Jesus. Amen. I want to be busy for the Lord. Amen. Let us have the same sort of mind of I'm doing what I'm doing for God. I'm doing what I'm doing not for money. I'm not doing what I'm doing for a paycheck. Amen. I'm not doing, I'm not teaching now. I'm not teaching Sunday school. I'm not, we're not doing these things for us. We're doing these things for God. Amen. Amen. Now if we aren't, Amen. If we're doing these things for rewards in this, in this world, amen, there's going to come a problem and we're going to be presented with um, temptation to err from the faith all because we, have a, we had greed in our heart because we were concerned about what we have now. So let's not be like Balaam. Amen. Amen. He said in verse 11, but thou, O man of God. Now we see but whenever you see the word but in your Bible, I want you to think of the American coin. Amen. We saw the, the heads, and we saw the word but. Now we're about to see tails. So he's saying some, they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But, now here's the opposite side. But thou, O man of God. Oh, I want to be a man of God. So I hope this is talking to me now. Amen. All right. O man of God, do what? Please. Flee these things. Don't flirt with them. We're never charged in the Bible to flirt with sin. How close can I get to the edge and not sin? We're charged with the opposite. He said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it proceeds the issues of life. And that word keep means guard. Guard your heart. Amen. Amen. Some of us watch football. Amen. Some of us like the Patriots. Amen. That's because some of us like the best. Amen. <laughs> but consider the defense on a football team. They're guarding that end zone, are they not? Amen. And all the, the, the time and effort they spend, the money they spend in their pads and their guards and the effort they spend into working out and practice and getting the formations right, all to stop somebody from getting a ball in a little area of grass. We need to have that same sort of mind in guarding our heart. I need to learn what is wrong with me and the sin that's in me and the problems that I have as an individual so that I can stay clear from them. I need to study to show myself approved unto God. We need to learn how do we get rid of these things. How do we avoid these things? How do we avoid, amen, becoming like these people? He told them, from such withdraw thyself. And here he says, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So the trick then is becoming content. Amen? All right, one more scripture. He said, take my time. All right. Amen. Take my time. Might be late for work tomorrow. We'll be here till 7.02. Philippians chapter 4. It's the last scripture. And verse number 11. And just give me an amen when you get there. All right. Now let's read. Not that I speak in respect of want for... I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Keep reading. Know how to be abased. Uh huh. And I know how to bound. Watch this. Everywhere and in some things. Everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Now, he said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am there with to be content. Being content with where we are in our lives takes a little learning. This is something that we have to learn how to do. He said, whatsoever state I am, old or young, got to be content. Rich or poor, got to be content. Amen. Long tie, short tie, got to be content. Amen. Old suit, new suit, got to be content. 
Amen. Dodge Stratus with a dent in the door, got to be content. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have to learn in whatsoever state we have to be, uh, to be content. Right. Amen. It's not something that always comes natural. See, we're not, it's not always just where we're at in our life. Sometimes things happen in our lives to make our life that much harder. Right. Now we've got to fight on our hands to be content. Am I going to be content in what God has allowed to happen in my life? Or am I going to step outside of the will of God and try to change it? He said, I've learned to be content. Now, the Apostle Paul wasn't one that was speaking um, without experience. See, um, Paul, I'm going to try to find the scripture here. The Apostle Paul um, healed folks, did he not? He said, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. So Paul was going around healing folks. Yet when it came to his infirmity in the flesh, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So he could heal other folks, but then when it came to his own problem, he couldn't be healed. So what did he have to learn? God, I can't even heal my own self right now. I'm going to have to learn to be content with your grace because it's enough for me. Amen. Sometimes we have to do that. Amen. We've got a problem in our flesh. We have to learn to be content. How do we learn to be content? Amen. That's even with amen, our positions in the church. How do we learn to be content with where we're at? See, because it's not wrong to desire the work. Uh, the Bible says if any man desire uh, the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Amen. Um, but the problem becomes when I'm stepping outside of the will of God and my heart is towards those things and not God. So how do I learn to be content? Well, at least one way I can think of is even on our jobs. Amen. The more effort we put into our job while we're at work, the more rewarding it feels. Amen? Amen. The more effort we put into the harder that we work, it's a, it's a sense of accomplishment. It's a sense of ownership. So you get a new car, and you keep it nice and clean, you keep it detailed on the inside, Amen. And someone comes in with a package of uh, Takis or a package of Cheetos, you look twice at the bag real quick, you know, because someone's bringing food in your car. But a couple years start going by, and you're not putting the work into that car anymore. So who cares if you, if you drop a slice of pizza on the dash? <laughs> the more work we put into something, the more rewarding it is. Let's stay busy for God. Let's stay busy in what it is that we're doing. Whatever it is that we do, let's put our, our heart into it all the way. Amen. Whatever it is that we have in life, let's be faithful over it. First and primarily faithful to God. How do we become more content? Walking with the Lord. Amen. And not having all the things and privileges that the world has. Amen. Start getting busy with God. Amen. Start studying our Bibles and fasting and praying. Amen. And learning to be content. Amen. All right, we're done. You stand on your feet.